And so we'll be recording the webinar uh, so that those who can't make it because of time zone or other scheduling conflicts can join. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about um, how we're going to run the webinar as we uh, haven't done this before. This is our first one, and uh, it's actually my first webinar in psychology. I've seen this happen in kind of uh, non-academic contexts, but it's rare that we have kind of electronic communication in uh, academic contexts. So uh, a couple of uh, ground rules. We uh, distributed a form with an opportunity to ask questions earlier on uh, last week. And um, thank you for putting in some questions to that. We've tried to address them where possible, either during the presentation itself or at the end uh, in a Q&A section where we've put some kind of answers in there. Uh, if you have questions that come up as you're listening or at the end of the presentation, please type them into the chat box, which you'll find in the uh, right-hand toolbar. I, each, mo each speaker has a moderator who's going to be monitoring the questions during their part of the talk and then uh, restating those to the group uh, if they're judged to be relevant to that particular portion. Um, and so we'll try to take as many questions as we can that are relevant after each section of the presentation, and then we'll take remaining questions at the end. We have a total of 90 minutes uh, in case a lot of questions come up or there's particular aspects of discussion. We can wrap up early if uh, we get through the material before then. In a couple of cases, uh, people have asked already quite specific questions. Uh, in those cases, we may email you uh, a link to the relevant project documentation. Please bear with us as we continue to try to refine our organization of this documentation. There's a lot of material related to this project from the nuts and bolts of how the stimuli were created and the raw data there, all the way through to the specific analyses that we've planned and the simulations and so forth that have gone into that. So we're trying to get that all in a very readable format along with the instructions for uh, contributors and it, it's un maybe unsurprisingly a complicated project. So please bear with us on that front. Okay, um, Casey, Melanie, anything you would like to add here before we get started and go on to content? Nope, I think we're good. Go ahead. Wonderful, thanks guys. Okay, so uh, what we'll be doing here is uh, four sections. I'll be giving an overview of the problem and the many babies approach. Then we'll transition into a section uh, that's gonna be jointly presented by me and Melanie on the infant directed speech preference and how we are approaching that in Many Babies One. We'll then move on to some of the really detailed nuts and bolts of setting up Many Babies One in your lab and Casey will be primarily presenting this. There'll be just one slide here uh, on the IRB issues. Uh, this is contributed by Elika Bergelson who could not be here today but uh, will be the contact for those issues. And then we'll move on to hopefully a fairly extensive Q&A where you guys can write in questions and uh, we will answer them as best we can. Okay, so this project begins, the Many Babies project begins in the context of uncertainty about uh, reproducibility and replicability. So reproducibility, uh, is the ability to get the same numbers from a study given the study's data, and replicability is the ability to uh, actually get new data that show the same measurements or show the same effects. Uh, shown here is the key figure from a large-scale study by the Open Science Collaboration published in 2015. This was 100 studies uh, replicated by independent researchers around the world, and uh, the results were somewhat disappointing. Many of the original studies did not show the same kind of thing as the original. Um, effect sizes were overall deflated relative to the original, and many were not statistically significant. Now, this has been a controversial study, uh, and the exact replicability rate that is implied by this study is unknown. It's a subject of debate. Nevertheless, I think many of us, myself included, were upset by these findings as they indicated a replicability rate. Uh, and features of the replication process that were more complex and less straightforward and uh, less robust than we would have hoped. So why do we have this kind of issue in psychology? Well, there are two families of reasons. Uh, the first is concerns about statistical power. 
So uh, statistical power is the uh, probability of detecting a true effect with a given effect size, uh, given a particular sample size. So in the classic statistical paradigm, sample size, uh, the number of participants you test, effect size, that is the scale-free measure of how big the difference between groups is in the standard paradigm, uh, and power all trade off with one another. So uh, the larger your sample size relative to a particular effect size, the higher your power. A, an important observation about psychology, and in fact, unfortunately, about science in general, including biomedical science, is that when you look across studies, uh, the majority of studies are typically underpowered. That means uh, they had fewer participants than would have been necessary to reliably recover the effect that they recover. How can you tell that? Well, you look at the size of the effects they recovered, you look at the number of participants, and then you, uh, you go back and uh, compare those two. But you can't do that on an individual study by study basis because it's not, uh, you know, you recover the, the power, you have appropriate power for the uh, effect you recover. Instead, what you do is you look at the mean effect across a literature and say, well, did most people have power to recover that effect? And the answer typically is no. Uh, our sample sizes are, for the most part, too small to recover the mean effect in our literatures, which means uh, then that there are certain uh, kind of real consequences that follow. Uh, in particular, uh, underpowered studies are subject to something called the winner's curse. So uh, when we see an underpowered study appear in a prestigious journal, we should assume that it's uh, an, it, giving an inflated estimate of the true effect that it could have recovered. Uh, so that means when somebody else next goes to do that study, they have a, an inflated sense of what the effect is that they should be uh, uh, measuring, and hence, when they actually go to measure it, they often succeed, uh, often fail, not because the effect is not there, it could be there, it could be not, but simply because they're underpowered relative to what they should be looking for. Uh, so in this way, literatures perpetuate a standard where there are relatively smaller samples than are necessary. That's one set of concerns around uh, reproducibility, replicability. Uh, the second is uh, questionable research practices, uh, as shown by a now uh, classic paper already uh, by Simmons, uh, Nelson, and Simonson. Uh, a small amount of analytic flexibility, that is flexibility in how you conduct your statistical analysis in terms of the preparation of data, the uh, addition of observations flexibly during the data collection process, the uh, uh, exclusion of outliers, uh, the control or not control for particular uh, demographic variables, all of these combine to add flexibility, which inflates the race, rate of false positives in the classic statistical testing paradigm. So that means if this analytic flexibility exists, it's easier to get to that uh, now magical standard of P less than 0.05, which allows publication in top journals. And hence, the effects that you had may not be as strong as is indicated by the p-values. So again, we've got kind of a higher rate of false positives and inflation of effect size that results from these conditions. And all of these factors have been argued to lead to the crisis in replicability documented by the 2015 paper. In the infancy research context, things are uh, more complicated. All of these concerns are compounded, um, plus there is, uh, by many accounts, broad variability in the data that are collected from lab to lab. Uh, there are methodological differences across labs. There is population variability. Uh, and there are many uh, proposed moderators of the effects that we recover as developmentalists. Um, maybe when we painted our lab blue, uh, all the babies suddenly were more interested in the walls, or so it seemed, than uh, in our stimuli, and we recovered no effects. Uh, when I worked in baby labs, people joked that uh, because I had a beard, I would make the babies cry. I joked about it too, and then I, it was kind of depressing because I was making the babies cry, it seemed like. Uh, we all have different suspicions about uh, second session babies, babies that um, are run in a study after the first study. Is that an acceptable practice? Is it not an acceptable practice? Uh, are the babies more tired? Do they habituate more quickly? Do they not show effects? Uh, these are all uh, questions that come up in this context. Um, and often, compounding this, uh, there is little absolutely direct replication where you do exactly the same thing as somebody else. Uh, 
I would argue that that's largely because of the high cost of data collection. It's really important to make every baby count when you're a developmentalist uh, because this is a limited resource. It's shared across uh, labs, sometimes ac across multiple labs in an institution. Uh, and it's very costly to, uh, to run a sample of babies on a direct replication condition. In addition, it's uh, difficult to replicate exact procedures. Uh, so even when we would like to do a direct replication, we often don't have the uh, open stimuli, uh, open procedures that would allow us to do everything exactly as a previous lab did. And we don't know which of the decisions that go into that direct replication truly matter. Uh, is the distance from the screen really the key variable? Is the uh, exact amplitude of the stimuli the key variable, and so forth. In sum, uh, there uh, are real issues in this literature that may be unacknowledged, uh, but we have uh, a lot of uncertainty about the uh, possibility of um, issues in replicability in the infancy context because we don't know how much these factors matter. Uh, how much does this variability contribute to issues in replicability in infancy? So our inspiration for the Many Babies Project is the Many Labs projects uh, that have come out of the Center for Open Science and the University of Virginia. Uh, briefly, those projects are attempts to ask many labs around the world to replicate a battery of studies. So both US and international labs uh, take a set, in this case, this is Many Labs 1 of around 13 studies, carry those out in their own labs, and then look at both the effect that is recovered for each individual study. Uh, that's the big circle with a confidence interval in the middle of each group, but also the variability around that. And that variability reveals whether a particular effect is dependent on context. They all are, but uh, how much they're de dependent on context as well. That can really tell us about the relative uh, validity of any individual measurement in terms of revealing uh, what measures would be, what measurement would be revealed by another lab if they were to replicate it. So we found these studies to be really interesting and uh, useful as a model for collaborative science going forward that tells you about what kinds of assumptions you have to make in comparing results across labs. One uh, example of a, an analysis that was very helpful here was that one of the many lab studies, a later many lab study, actually uh, compares adult participants that are recruited early in the academic semester versus late in the academic semester, directly addressing a key superstition or hypothesis that many researchers have about testing adults but in the college context, which is that later in the semester, they are more stressed out and hence your data are worse. It turns out that large scale study found no evidence for that observation. So that's really interesting and useful information that can be propagated throughout the field and used to inform future studies. That was one source of variability that people were worried about that they don't have to worry about in this context and can uh, then focus their activity productively on controlling for other things that may matter more. Okay, so uh, the Many Babies Consortium, uh, as we're calling ourselves, has three primary goals here, especially with Many Babies One. The first is to assess the reproducibility of key findings in the infancy literature. Uh, and we're starting with uh, the infant-directed speech preference, which we strongly believe to be a replicable finding. Uh, this is a conservative starting point, which we'll talk more about in a moment. Uh, two, to quantify the sources of variability in the uh, results that are measured across labs and to attribute those wherever possible to methodological choices, population differences, uh, and so forth. And three, uh, to create standards for best practices. That is to pursue a project that is done in an open spirit that allows anybody to adopt the same methodological choices and materials uh, procedures, uh, and that those materials and procedures come out of a discussion between many different labs who are interested in the relevant phenomena coming to consensus around what they think a set of best practices are. So uh, in my experience, this has been very helpful for nearly everybody participating because we're all converging around a set of standards and discussing the practices that we had ad often adopted from mentors or developed as we were developing our labs but hadn't questioned individually. And so uh, our awareness is being raised about the different choices that we make that are thought through differently by different labs. Okay, back to the outline. 
So uh, next we'll talk about infant-directed speech preference. Uh, but first, do we have any uh, questions? No questions so far at all. Pushing onward. So uh, many or most on this call will be familiar with the phenomenon of infant-directed speech. So uh, here we have a now classic figure, originally from Fernald and Cool, reprinted in Cool 2004, contrasting the uh, F0, the uh, fundamental frequency for adult-directed and infant-directed speech. To the, while the adult-directed speech shows some uh, minimal variability in the F0, you see this uh, contrast with uh, the incredible variability, the uh, huge pitch excursions, uh, and even register changes uh, in uh, infant-directed speech. This is characteristic especially of North American English infant-directed speech, where you see this massive pitch variability compared to the adult model. Uh, in addition, infant-directed speech has a number of other characteristics, syntactically less complex, uh, more well-formed, sentences are shorter, words are higher frequency. Uh, throughout all of the different levels of linguistic description, you see characteristic differences. So uh, infant-directed speech is, is, this is a caricature of the most variable um, prosody, but uh, it's present in many cultures, albeit variable in its uh, in the size of the difference between infant and adult-directed speech. Uh, and it's been argued, albeit controversially, that it facilitates a wide number of early language acquisition achievements, uh, from the identification of speech sounds to segmentation to revealing uh, syntactic structure. Now, each of those claims has been controversial, uh, but overall, the theoretical role played by infant-directed speech is as facilitating certain aspects of language acquisition as a specifically uh, targeted signal that is helpful for engaging children's attention, young children's attention, uh, and allowing them to learn. And across the literature, across the past 20, uh, 25 years, there have been many, many studies of infant's preference for infant-directed speech. So a classic example of this is uh, Robin uh, Panaton. Uh, published as Cooper and Aslan, uh, who used a very simple paradigm, uh, which is a um, preferential looking paradigm with a sequential presentation to measure both, uh, I believe, three-month-olds and newborns' preference for infant-directed speech. She simply played infant-directed speech versus adult-directed speech, and this was red speech created by actors, uh, two babies, as they watched an uninformative checkerboard stimulus. Uh, and she monitored their fixation to that stimulus as the different types of speech were playing uh, and showed that in both age groups, there was a robust preference for the infant-directed speech. So in each study that does this kind of thing, you can uh, capture the variability in looking times across infants uh, compared to the uh, size of the difference between infant-directed and adult-directed speech looking times. Uh, this standardization yields an effect size. Uh, so here we're using a standardized effect size, Cohen's D, uh, which measures in standard deviations of difference between uh, the control and experimental conditions. Uh, and what you see here is a, um, a replot of a meta-analysis by Dunst, Gorman, and Hamby looking at this literature, plotting uh, the effect size recovered in infant-directed speech paradigms across ages. And uh, what you see is nearly all of the studies recover an IDS preference, certainly not every single one. Uh, you wouldn't expect that given the size of the studies, you'd expect some variation. But the mean effect size that's recovered is D equals 0.71, which is between a medium and a large effect according to the standard interpretation guidelines. Uh, in addition, there's some evidence, as you can see from this trend line, it's not strong evidence, but some evidence for uh, that uh, preference increasing across development, but as far as we know, uh, it's certainly present uh, around one or two months, and uh, there's one data point that indicates it's present at birth, or shortly thereafter. So this is, uh, by all accounts, a robust phenomenon, at least in the uh, labs that have studied it, which have primarily studied it in English-speaking uh, uh, infants. Recently, there's been an emerging literature that suggested that the kind of facilitation from infant-directed speech that you get uh, in these North American English-speaking households is maybe less robust 
in cultures where you see less infant directed speech in the home. And so that's an emerging narrative. Nevertheless, uh, the claimed theoretical model here, this is a Pisonian Aslan figure uh, for infant directed speech, uh, is that we, uh, it's claimed to be available right after birth. This is a bias, perhaps attentional in nature, perhaps uh, perceptual in nature, perhaps communicative in nature, we don't know, uh, that is available at birth and is maintained in uh, cultures where uh, infant directed speech is used frequently and potentially lost. Uh, or lost faster in those cultures which don't use this as a robust signal for uh, grabbing attention by infants. So one goal of our current study is to map out this uh, potential pattern, map out these curves. So one possibility for the uh, effects we recover is that we see a preference for infant-directed speech uh, present in the youngest children in our sample. Uh, in that it, uh, maintain, this maintained robustly in English speakers and stays around the meta-analytic uh, estimate right through the first birthday, whereas in uh, non-North American English speaking children uh, who are hearing infant-directed speech in North American English, uh, they show that robust preference and there's some evidence that they do show that. Uh, for example, Chinese learning babies will prefer North American English IDS to ADS. Uh, but then that, that preference will be reduced over development such that uh, by the time they are producing language themselves, they will be less likely to prefer infant-directed speech in a non-native language. So this gradual specialization uh, and loss of preference in non-English speakers is a prediction, theoretical prediction of uh, the general account of IDS preferences and is something that our study might allow us to recover. Okay, uh, let me uh, turn things over to Melanie briefly so that she can talk about the choice of using North American English in our study. Right, so uh, I think uh, Mike already did a, a good job of uh, talking to the advantage of, um, uh, one of the advantages of using North American English. Um, so, oh, okay, start uh, backing up a little bit. So we, we, we had a number of discussions uh, about this over the early phases of the project, and uh, there was a lot of concern about uh, making sure that um, uh, different uh, cultural and linguistic contexts were, were fully represented. Um, but we had the issue of the, the reality is that the robust literature on infant-directed speech is uh, very highly skewed towards um, samples in uh, North American English, uh, although there are a few studies that look at uh, preferences in other languages. Uh, and because one of the major goals of this project was to pick something that was really robust and that we expected to have an effect, we didn't want to bring in a whole bunch of labs to run a, uh, to, to look at variability in a robust effect and then find it wasn't a robust effect. Um, so uh, we decided to stick with North American English, despite the fact that this adds some complexity to some of the analyses. Um, so it has the advantage that it's, it uh, allows us to stick to the robust literature. It also has a really important uh, advantage in that uh, if, we, if we aren't uh, sticking with North American English or if we allow uh, different labs to record their own stimuli that would be appropriate for their uh, language community, then there would be absolutely no way to maintain consistency across labs. So we had to stick with one lab language and we decided to stick with uh, robust literature on um, now, obviously, there's uh, both a drawback and a strength, really, uh, that this is going to be a non-native language for some of the labs. So there's a little bit of a confound uh, between uh, whether it differences across labs and differences across language. Uh, and we have put some thought in the analysis side of things to um, make sure that we're uh, drawing on the strengths of that so that we tease apart what's um, differences in methodology versus uh, differences in linguistic communities. Uh, and the advantage of that, obviously, is that it actually allows us to address some, uh, some really interesting questions uh, about cross-linguistic and cross-cultural effects that, that, that can only really be answered in a, a multi-lab study like this. So that's, that's both exciting and challenging. Um, the other uh, challenge that we faced in picking our stimuli is that um, there were a variety of choices in the range between highly controlled and uh, highly ecologically valid um, stimuli, uh, and we, uh, we, we tried to look at some of the, um, the 
the possibility of using some of the original recordings from some of the, the uh, original studies uh, to make this more of a direct replication. Uh, and unfortunately, that wasn't possible for a number of reasons uh, due to uh, the, uh, the nature of the recordings, the age group that some of those recordings were designed for, um, and the age groups that we're targeting, uh, and also a lot of labs, uh, you know, these are recordings from back in the day, and most labs did not conceive of the idea that we would be sharing these audio stimuli across, you know, hundreds of people all around the world, and so they just didn't have permission to share them uh, properly. Um, so in the end, we went with recording our own stimuli. Uh, we went with um, a sort of a bit of a compromise, but leaning towards ecological validity in recording uh, moms in the laboratory talking to their babies uh, uh, on a constrained set, about a constrained set of objects, uh, and then talking to uh, an adult experimenter about those same objects. Um, and then, and then uh, uh, selecting um, clip, audio clips from those recordings that uh, were uh, balanced as, as best we could on a variety of factors and uh, excluding noise and baby noises and things like that. Um, the disadvantage of this approach is obviously uh, that it's because it's naturalistic recording, semi-naturalistic recordings, we can't uh, fully control for absolutely everything. Um, but the only way to do that would be some sort of red speech approach. And the problem with that for uh, infant directed speech is that you don't really know what you're actually analyzing at that point. Um, so it's, you know, it's a uh, it's a, a problem that different people have solved in different ways, and, and we've gone with a slightly more naturalistic approach. Um, that's, that's everything I have for that slide. Great. Thank you, Melanie. Okay. So uh, let me just say briefly that uh, we have developed the protocol for many babies over the course of a number of collaborative discussions. We developed the stimuli along Melanie's uh, description and then uh, tried to create a stimulus set that was uh, a good representation and relatively well balanced across IDS and ADS. We're still working out the final kinks in that stimulus set. We're doing a little bit of extra re-editing and balancing of the noise, trying to really get uh, these stimuli as acoustically clean as we can. So that was the topic of the call right before this current one. That said, uh, five labs agreed to pilot this procedure, trying to work out the kinks, get our data analysis in order, and really test out the procedures that we were proposing. And in this pilot study, we had 65 participants, which is already a lot for an infancy study. So this gives you a sense of the scope of the operation. Pilot labs were UBC, Brooks at Oxford, Plymouth, UK, LPP in Paris, uh, and my own lab at Stanford. They used three different methods, which are the three methods uh, represented in many babies, single screen, uh, sequential preference, the head turn preference procedure, uh, and eye tracking on a single screen. Uh, and these labs uh, contributed different sample sizes. You can see the largest was contributed by UBC. Uh, and there's clearly variability in the effect sizes. Whether that's reliable, we don't know. Uh, but the meta-analytic estimate that emerged from these pilot studies was right about exactly D equals 0.7, which as you'll recall was just about where we were with respect to the uh, uh, original meta-analysis that I showed. So that's very good. Um, this was keeping me up at night, and I was very pleased to see that the pilot study recovered an effect of infant-directed speech, which allows us to go forward and really think about the moderators of that effect. So uh, in, the, in the study and in the protocol, uh, as you'll read it, you'll see that one of our foci is the uh, effect size we recover, but we wouldn't need all of you to participate if that were our primary question of interest. Instead, now we want to ask, hey, can we get enough data to really understand what makes LPP in Paris different from Stanford? Or are they really different? Is that just uh, chance? Is that just noise variation? How can we quantify differences demographically, methodologically, culturally that matter to these outcomes? And further, how can we leverage these data to provide some methodological best practices? Uh, were second session babies across all of the babies that are run in this study, were they more robust in terms of uh, recovered effect size or less robust? Uh, how did those data look? Can we say anything about the shape of the habituation curve uh, for all of these babies across uh, different labs and different countries across ages and so forth? So you can see there are many rich questions that can be answered using these data sets far beyond is it D equals 0.7 or D equals 0.4.
That's the starting point, but it is far from the ending point. In that spirit, uh, we've engaged in some new practices regarding the Many Babies study, uh, in particular pre-review and pre-registration. So trying to address some of the concerns about biases in the literature that we've seen previously, our goal in this study is to fix all of the details and analytic plan prior to data collection, to remove these opportunities for analytic flexibility, thus allowing us to recover an uninflated and unbiased estimate of effect size, as well as an unbiased estimate of the moderators that we care about on variability. Uh, that's a new challenge. It's not something that I've done before, and I think that's true for most of the people in the group. Uh, and it has been very challenging. We've spent now more than a year discussing the details of this protocol and paradigm, writing them up into a paper, collecting pilot data, all before anybody has collected a single data point of real data in this project. And the goal is to uh, foresee all of the decision points that we're going to have in the analysis process uh, and make good best practices decisions on those. We're far along in this process right now. Uh, we submitted the protocol document that's been circulated to you guys to AMPS, Advances in Methods and Practices in Psychological Science, which is a new journal that is being started by the APS for this kind of pre-reviewed uh, methodological contribution that we're trying to make here. It's edited by Dan Simons, who's graciously agreed to step in even before he was confirmed as editor uh, and curate the review process for us. So he's received reviews from two expert reviewers, and we're in the process of addressing those comments before sending it back out to him. We anticipate and hope that he will uh, approve the protocol at that time. Then we'll hit the button uh, and freeze the analyses and the protocol documents, all hopefully organized appropriately, uh, and go on to carry out the study. At that point, we'll give you guys the signal and we'll begin collecting data for real. And I've been saying April 1st is the anticipated date for that. I still hope that we can make that date, but uh, I will be in touch with the exact details of uh, when to begin data collection as we find out the outcome of the review process. Just one note here on the issue of pre-review and pre-registration. We are fixing certain key analytic decisions in the uh, analysis pipeline in order to provide an unbiased estimate of certain quantities of interest. But we think there's a lot more you can do with this data set that we are not pre-registering and not pre-specifying in advance. And we fully expect that both our manuscript and other subsequent manuscripts will have both exploratory and confirmatory sections. So uh, we've written the confirmatory section already. And when I hit go on the R script, hopefully, uh, it will compute the appropriate statistics and insert them appropriately into the manuscript. But there's ma there are many things that we can't specify in advance. Uh, and those exploratory analyses will also, w when they're of interest, make it into the manuscript. And we hope you guys will be some of the folks suggesting those exploratory analyses. And if an exploratory analysis can't make it into our already long and complicated manuscript, we hope you will do new uh, experiments, new analyses, new simulations, and write your own papers about this data set. The goal is to create something that is reusable by the community and forms a test bed for new ideas. So please don't hesitate to get in contact with me or any of the other folks on this call or other organizers that you talk to about ideas for moving forward and uh, creatively reusing the materials and uh, data from this project. One final bit here, uh, I want to give a plug for a sister project, Many Babies Bilingual. Uh, so Krista Byers Heinlein has, uh, in extremely rapid time, put together a second manuscript, which is currently, uh, or maybe about to be, under review at AMPS for a, uh, a manuscript answering the question of, uh, of the magnitude of the IDS preference in bilinguals, how it differs from the preference in monolinguals, and how it changes with bilingual experience. This will be a separate pre-registration, a separate paper, and a separate analysis with a uh, complicated Venn diagram of authors with the original. Uh, if you're interested in this project and want to contribute, please get in touch with Krista, as there's still time to coordinate your own bilingual sample alongside your monolingual sample, since uh, I believe all of the labs contributing here will be contributing matched monolingual and bilingual samples in order to facilitate a matched analysis. OK, uh, let's take questions now on uh, this aspect of the study design with respect to IDS. Do we have anything to address before we move on? Nobody has um, typed anything in the chat window. Uh, oh, until this second.
you just asked a question, um, saying a more detailed question, perhaps for later. But if I, here's the question. If I recall correctly, the stimuli were drawn from IDS directed towards infants of a narrower range than the testing range. Is there a concern that we might find greater preference in infants in the age range that the stimuli were directed to? Melanie, would you like to address this? I have some thoughts, but you've thought more about this, this particular question than I have. Sure. Um, so I think there's a slide coming up uh, on this, but we've already sort of touched on it. Um, the infants that were selected for uh, the uh, recording were between about four months and about eight months. Um, so yes, there is a broader age range that's being tested um, than um, uh, than uh, than the the is the the age range that the stimuli were recorded on. Um, it provides some interesting questions for follow up. I think that that we had to. Um, I, I don't think it would have worked to broaden the age range uh, further, and we didn't want to have different stimuli for different age ranges. Um, so certainly we may. So one of the interesting things, if you go back to that um, uh, Dunst graph that uh, Mike had shown earlier, there's actually a fairly uh, small number of studies that were was certainly that were included in that. I know there were some others that have uh, looked at older um, age ranges beyond the range that was in that study. Uh, but comparatively, there are much fewer studies looking at the older age ranges. So we really don't uh, know as well what those older ranges uh, are, um, are doing. Uh, so I think that for me, that's one of the exciting things about this, that we can look at sort of the developmental uh, side of things. Uh, but of course, yes, uh, that is going to sort of limit the interpretation because what we'll be saying is that 12 to 15 month olds do or don't continue to like to prefer speech that's directed at four to eight month olds. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Here's a great question from uh, Jess Hay. So um, Jess writes, are there any issues with pseudo replication and using many fewer stimuli than participants? Uh, and this, is a, this brings attention to a really important point in the discussion of reproducibility and replicability that's been overlooked previously uh, in many communities, namely stimulus variability and stimulus sampling. So in brief, the issue is that if you want to make a generalization about people uh, in your population, you need to have a sufficiently broad sample of people in your population to make that generalization. That's our requirements on N. But the same statistical point is true for stimuli. So if you want to make a generalization about nouns, then you need to sample enough nouns to generalize uh, technically. And this point was originally made, I should plug, uh, by uh, Herb Clark in 1973. It's, he called it the stimulus as fixed effect fallacy. Herb is part of my department, and he reminds me of this at any opportunity. Uh, so uh, as a result, we've become careful about this sort of thing. Now, this issue presents a challenge in replication research because to the extent that the original studies that you replicate provide a particular methodological template with, in some cases, just a very small set of stimuli or you know, one or two even, I, you then have to ask yourself, do I want to replicate that procedure uh, as closely as I can or do I want to replicate uh, a, a procedure that has much more variable stimuli? I, I want to, do I want to sample stimuli with sufficient diversity to uh, ensure generalizability. So I think here we've tried to navigate this in a particular way. Uh, that is, we have stayed relatively close to the classic uh, approach in, in developmental psychology of having a relatively small stimulus set. Uh, so in this case, there are 16 recordings, eight pairs of IDS and ADS. So it's a little bit larger than other studies, but but still quite small. Uh, so to so as to be able to directly compare the uh, um, the measurements we recover on those fairly tightly controlled stimuli. On the other hand, where I think we differ from uh, other studies in this literature and in general in infancy is that we do have very strong documentation of our stimulus generation procedure. So uh, you know exactly what we've done in order to uh, create these stimuli, and uh, it would be theoretically and even practically possible to create more stimuli like this very easily. I mean, modular the amount of work that's gone into it, but but there's no uh, question about the details. You make recordings using these objects, these microphones, you norm them in this way, you run them through these Pratt scripts, and then you will end up with stimuli like ours. 
So in principle, we're trying to uh, give the generation process so that other people can create stimuli like ours. In practice, I, I think it would have been very challenging for us to create something like four or eight or 10 uh, different stimulus sets of the type we created here and retain any of the kind of control that we had. Uh, this was already quite a substantial undertaking to develop these stimuli. And so uh, faced with that, and faced with the variability that would be created by creating many, many stimulus sets uh, and running them in individual labs uh, via some counterbalancing scheme or something like this, we decided to opt for the classic approach. But I, I think the concern is a really valid one, and it's a really important one to think about uh, going forward. OK, thanks for the questions. Uh, I'm going to move us now uh, on to um, Casey's section. Please. Uh, so participants and eligibility, or is this, this is Melanie, so, sorry, Melanie and Case will be presenting this section. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, so we uh, uh, had a lot of discussion about uh, sample sizes, and, and uh, the upshot of that discussion was that uh, because one of the things that we were most interested in is understanding variation across labs, um, the uh, um, the power that we were most interested in was uh, power based on the number of, of uh, laboratories, um, and so and and also because the effect size was uh, fairly uh, large uh, for um, for the medium to large <laughs> uh, for uh, infant directed speech, we uh, have been fairly. Um, uh, Sorry, I haven't, haven't thought through what I'm saying here. Um, we're, we're being fairly generous uh, in trying to make it this something that is uh, relatively uh, not onerous on labs. So we keep the minimum participation very low at n equals 16. Uh, and that, um, that includes your discard. So if you have five discards and, five, and 11 good babies, you give us six, uh, five discards and 11 good babies. And, and that's your n equals 16. Now, of course, we would... Uh, much prefer that you give us more babies. So uh, what we're saying is that our preference is a minimum of N of 32, and that's in a given age group. Um, uh, but if all you feel that you can handle to give us is N equals 16, then uh, we welcome that, uh, or any number in between. Um, and you are more than welcome to contribute in uh, any one or subset or all of our four age bins. Uh, and again, we've sort of uh, selected broader age bins than is typical in part to make this not onerous on labs that we know this is a secondary um, study for you guys. Um, so it's uh, three to six months, six to nine months, nine to 12 and 12 to 15 uh, age bins. Uh, and we ask that you center the, the mean in the middle of the age bin and have some sort of distribution. So please don't give us all five month olds in your three to six month old uh, age bin. Um, and uh, if you want to give us 32 babies in all four of those age bins, uh, we, God bless you. <laughs> but uh, what, what you think you can manage is uh, what we would uh, welcome. Uh, we have a set of eligibility criteria. We tried to keep those fairly standard. So monolingual, it doesn't have to be English learning. Uh, Full-term babies, which we uh, set at uh, 37 plus weeks gestation. Uh, generally, typically developing a normal hearing, and you can see more details about how we define each of those in the instructions. There's a link there. Um, we had a lot of discussion about uh, first session versus second session babies, uh, and we we welcome both first session and second session babies. But um, I, what we caution is is simply that um, uh, we don't want these to be your throwaway babies. So uh, please stick with existing. Uh, policies in your lab and uh, treat these babies the way that you would want to treat your your own data um, because if you don't do that then uh, you're contributing noise to the sample essentially um, so uh, the other issue is piloting and uh, stopping rules um, so we uh, you may want to uh, take a few babies to kind of get yourself going and pilot the the sample and make sure that the you know the the, the study is running properly and that uh, you are running through the process the way that it's supposed to, um, please be very, very clear about the transition between pilot babies and babies that you're actually uh, planning to contribute to the sample. Um, and, uh, and similarly, please make sure that you have a very explicit stopping rule in your lab. 
Um, we uh, we do allow uh, different labs to have their own stopping rules depending on what's convenient for you in your data collection and what your typical stopping rule is. Uh, but we just ask that labs be very explicit about it and that if you do change your um, your the the size of your sample or or have to change something about your stopping rule or end early or something that you make that decision making um, not based on the data that you're getting either based on the number of discards that you're getting or if you your peak data peaking uh, not based on data peaking uh, ideally we would say no data peaking at all uh, but that's that's simply not uh, practical uh, for some labs so if you if you have to data peak try and have some sort of a firewall between whoever's looking at the data and the decision making that, that occurs around uh, data collection and just keep us informed about any changes that you need to make. Is that a fair representation, do you think, Mike? Okay, should we tackle questions? Oh, no, or should we? I yeah, guess we there, go there on are a bunch of great questions, actually. Yeah, should we do that now or go finish this section? Let's, uh, let's report on some of the action in the chat window. Uh, so one question that just came in, uh, is it okay to decide later on including more age bins above uh, those declared at the initial sign up? Yeah, good question. So, I mean, ideally you are making those decisions ahead of time, um, but I think as long as, um, you know, as long as, again, as long as that decision isn't made, is made based on the fact that, oh, suddenly this age range has become available, yeah, we would welcome that being added into the sample. Um, but the, the, the key factor here is that we're trying to be very, very careful about data analysis and not allowing, um, you know, like, we just don't want you to say, oh, well, you know, 11 of my 16 babies have bust out, so I want to collect more babies so that I'm contributing more to the sample, because that will um, change things in the analysis. And guest six asks, uh, is there a, a discard policy? Uh, how do we decide uh, which data um, are getting discarded? And then I'll add on that, um, and what do we do with the discarded data? Right, so uh, you are, are not making uh, decisions about uh, which babies are discarded. So I guess, yeah, I spoke in a way that was perhaps confusing with respect to that. Uh, if the baby enters the testing room, we want to see those data. Um, and uh, so we want your inform we so you are going to employ your existing policies about when to stop, you know, like if a baby's too fussy and fusses out, you employ your existing policies on that um, and then provide us all of the information that you have. Uh, but the the uh, we're also using partial data. So uh, as much as possible, we need the information about the trials that are are good trials and bad trials. and then all of the data, analysis decisions about what gets discarded and what doesn't get discarded um, are made um, at, at the centrally. So we're, we're not, we don't want to go in and look at your videos and decide which trials should be discarded or not. Uh, but in terms of whether a baby is going to be discarded uh, and whether there are sufficient number of usable trials to include that baby uh, are being made centrally in the analysis. Great. Uh... Great. Here's one more a question from uh, Linda Polka. Um, is it okay to include both first and second session babies or should you stick with one type? Uh, no, uh, in, in fact, if, if you're collecting second session babies, we would appreciate uh, also getting some first section, session babies from the same lab um, under the assumption that that would be, uh, but, but if, if it is your lab policy to run some studies that are only second session babies, then we would, uh, and, and that's all you can give us, then we would welcome that. Um, but we just don't want you to uh, apply criteria that are um, less good to this study than you would to your own study. Is that a fair way of describing it? Yeah, uh, yeah that's great. And uh, let me address a couple of questions about language background. Uh, so, there, one question asks about um, reporting monolingualism versus uh, doing paperwork that includes language information. Uh, another person asked about um, whether you're monolingual, non-English, but in an English environment. Uh, so the way we are assessing language status is basically that we provide uh, some, a basic language status questionnaire if you don't have one. If you do have one, as long as it asks about percentage English, which is our key question, then uh, you um, can use your own questionnaire. 
uh, when that questionnaire is administered, that becomes the point uh, at which the data is fixed for that child. Even if they said they were monolingual English uh, when they came in, but then it turns out they, they come in, they fill out the form, uh, and they have a Spanish speaker uh, providing care for 30 hours a week, that baby is now um, not, uh, you know, that, that proportion they report on the form is now the representative proportion for that baby, and so they would be excluded on language status. Uh, so there are a number of different categories of exclusion in our analysis. Uh, for folks who are tested, but uh, nevertheless, during the time in the lab report some exclusion criteria, those are reported to us, uh, and we're, we'll exclude them based on uh, kind of language status. Most language status babies, we're guessing, will so, you know, you'll select them at the recruitment stage, so you're not spending a lot of time testing babies you're not including. But uh, if it, they do slip through that initial filter, then we uh, exclude them later. Uh, can I can I add to that, Mike? Um, what we did have a, a lot of discussion about how carefully we wanted to check on this, and uh, I think it was uh, Krista's study that uh, gave us some data that uh, a criterion of ninety percent uh, of the the primary language uh, was sufficiently well uh, correlated with eighty percent based on a much more complex uh, questionnaire that we were comfortable with people just using a Sing, single parental question, uh, what's the percentage of input um, from your uh, baby uh, at 90%? And we sort of use that as that's good enough. So you don't need to give them a, a complex uh, questionnaire. You can just ask them that question if that's what your typical lab, lab practice is. Now, if you're participating in the Many Babies Bilingual side project, um, we do for that one, we are going to ask for a more complex questionnaire uh, and uh, we uh, we have some um, people who are uh, happy to help out to help you um, design one that's appropriate for your language community if you don't have one. Um, a question from GW. Structure of IDS changes with age and sensitivity to that structure has been demonstrated. How is that taken into consideration in the analysis plan? So I. Here, I think we're talking again about uh, the same questions about changes to uh, what infants are interested in in IDS. Is it you know, per particularly perceptual aspects, particularly linguistic structure in the IDS, uh, and developmental changes both in the IDS itself that the kids are hearing and in the children's sensitivity? So uh, as Melanie has been talking about, uh, we are trying to walk a particular line here where I uh, the more stuff varies across ages or across labs, for example, the structure of the IDS for particular ages or the structure of the stimulus for particular language groups, the less we can compare across labs in the measurements we make. So uh, in our paper, we have hopefully been clear enough in delineating that we are measuring with a single stimulus across a wide range of cultures and a wide range of ages and measuring sensitivity to that particular stimulus or stimulus set. So that's, uh, that's one approach to this problem. Uh, in our analysis, we then can uh, not worry about the joint stimulus and developmental or joint stimulus and cultural effect and simply measure cultural effects, which we do with a planned analysis of North American English versus non-North American English labs and exploratory analyses of particular cultures where we have uh, density. Uh, and in terms of development, uh, we can then model uh, both linear and nonlinear uh, trends in the uh, in the development. So we we plan a simple linear analysis of uh, the developmental slope, but then in our exploratory analyses, we uh, are looking at the um, nonlinear patterns of development across age in case those uh, emerge. Okay, um, let's let's press onward. So next from Melanie. Okay, uh, I think I've talked about this uh, already a little bit. Uh, there's uh, a link uh, in the slideshow here to the um, the audio stimulus folder and the video stimulus folders in the Google Drive. Uh, there are other places where you can find this information as well. Um, so the uh, the stimuli, as Mike said, went through a pretty long and involved uh, process, which which isn't done. So you may find if you've already set up your study that we may come back to you in a little bit and give you a new set of audio files. Uh, so we apologize in advance if we do that to you. Um, but we're trying to address some important reviewer concerns and concerns 
uh, brought forward by some people who um, uh, recently joined the uh, you know the more conceptual side of the project. Um, and we want to make sure that everything is you know crossed T's and dotted I's uh, before we you know go whole hog on this thing. So um, they were uh, the process involved uh, collecting uh, recordings of mom talking semi naturalistically with. Um, uh, their babies, where they took an object out one by one from uh, a bag and uh, described, uh, talked, sorry, uh, talked about them with their baby, uh, and then did the same thing with uh, uh, an experimenter. Um, and they just were uh, uh, told to talk about the object essentially until they ran out of something to say and then pick up the next object. Um, and so there were a total of 15 moms in the original sample across two laboratories. Um, and uh, then there was a whole uh, norming process that uh, um, was done. We did some ratings of the stimuli, low pass filtered and not low pass filtered on a, on a, a variety of characteristics. Uh, sorry, so I'll back up a little bit. So those recordings were uh, then ed, uh, initially uh, sort of a, a by hand sub selection took place uh, to exclude noise and uh, other problems that were in the recording and to sort of chunk them up into shorter segments. Those were were then set through uh, a norming process um, where we got ratings and then selected to um, uh, match on uh, a variety of characteristics. And then we did some other things to try and make sure that the volumes were similar. And, and uh, there's there's details of that in the OSF um, uh, drive, uh, the OSF files. Uh, you can explore uh, to your heart's content if you're curious about how all that um, took place. Um, and uh, then we ended up with this uh, set of um, uh, eight infant-directed speech samples and eight adult-directed speech samples that were matched on a variety of, of characteristics. Uh, so the visual displays, uh, we've uh, provided some uh, visual displays uh, in the, the Google Drive folder uh, to use for the various different uh, methodologies. Uh, so there's this uh, video of a laughing baby to use for recentering. Um, there's a, a colorful checkered border to use for the, the visual um, stimulus uh, if you if you do that in your um, uh, procedure. Uh, and there's a variety of uh, yeah people who can help with uh, questions about that uh, in terms of uh, setup. I think we're on the next slide, Mike. And this okay. is Casey this is, still around? This is Casey. Yeah, I'll take over um, for just a few minutes and I'll try to keep this brief so we can get through everything and answer questions. Um, so the main point about the nuts and bolts of this study is that we wanna make it easy for each participating lab. We assume each of you have some kind of setup you use for studies of this general nature, whether it's head turn preference or a single screen setup or eye tracking. So we've made recommendations about ways to um, implement each of these um, different methods. We'd love it if everybody could stick as close as possible to those, but we know that there is variability across labs and we will ask for careful documentation of what exactly you're doing. And if you have questions about setting this up um, on your equipment, you can email me as a point person and I will put you in touch with um, somebody who might be using the same method and will be able to address the problems they're having. We have point people for each method. Um, well, we hope at least for a broad range of methods. Um, and we, we hope that um, these individuals can either provide scripts that you could set up quite easily, or at least some feedback on why your program might be crashing um, for whatever reason. And the information about nuts and bolts is available on a Google Doc that I shared in the chat window about 10 minutes ago, but a lot has happened since then, so scroll up a little bit. Um, very quickly, there are 18 trials total. There are two training trials that involve music. There are eight infant-directed speech preference trials and eight adult-directed speech trials. And there are four pseudo-randomized orders that um, we will be sharing with you in various ways. We prefer an infant-controlled set up if possible, but we realize that some labs only have um, the ability to do a fixed trial length design, and that's okay. The trial structure will be um, as follows. The onset, right, in a typical head turn preference study would be there's an attention getter like the laughing baby video that Melanie described a moment ago, and when the baby fixates, you press a button, 
and then the visual stimulus, in this case, the checkerboard ideally, or using whatever you normally use in your lab will appear on the sides. In an eye tracking setup or single screen, there will be an attention getter. And then um, after either one second, if you're coding manually, or two seconds of fixation, if it's um, automatic and gaze contingent, um, then the, um, the checkerboard would appear and the sound would begin. I won't explain why we have this one versus two second rule, but you can ask me if you have questions. The offset of each trial will be um, the baby looking away for two or more seconds continuously or when the 21 second sound file ends. So the maximum looking time on each trial is 21 seconds. Next slide, please, Mike. Um, briefly, we will not be repeating failed trials so that we can have more consistency across labs. Um, pausing or restarting the experiment is OK during training trials those two music trials at the beginning, but um, we will not be pausing or restarting at all once the first test trial begins, um, again, to create more consistency across labs. Um, we, of course, want to keep experimenters as blind as possible to what um, the content is of each trial. So if your experimenter is sitting in a separate room, um, perhaps outside of a you know sound insulated room, then you're all set, ideally, and they don't have visual or auditory access to what um, kind of trial it is. And um, if not, if they're in the same room, which seems to apply to about 25 to 30% of labs, according to our questionnaires, um, please have the experimenter use noise canceling headphones and some kind of audio mask. And similarly, we want to reduce parent bias by having them listen to music on headphones. So um, parents uh, in your lab will ideally be, be doing so. And according to our questionnaire, pretty much every lab has the ability to do this. Um, and we can talk more about funding for headphones if you need uh, if you need that. And we want you to report human errors as closely as possible. Each lab has a different method for doing this, but if on you know trial six or something something weird happens, we want to know about this. And if there are technology mishaps, we also want you to report that, and we'll have guidelines for um, for doing that in an organized fashion. And then. We ideally want you to be doing this study with trained research assistants in your lab. The general rule of thumb we have is that um, we want you to use the same care and caution in having people run the study for many babies as you would for any other study in your lab. We trust you to use appropriate training guidelines. Next slide. Just to speak up for one moment before you, we advance, um, let me mention that we have a specific uh, audio mask that we would like you to use, which is a mix of lovely jazz music and a randomized assortment and amplitude varied assortment of the stimulus items to really try and mask what you're hearing as much as possible. And thanks to Alex Christia and uh, Daniel Kellier for their work on creating this. So this is a bit redundant um, and it does address in part a question that was just posed in the chat window, but there are three options for equipment as you may have picked up by now. Um, you can use your eye tracker, your automated eye tracker of various forms, and we want to have a um, point person for each of these, and ideally that person can share a script with you if you happen to use the same, you know, Toby eye tracker or iLink um, uh, eye tracker. So yes, we hope we can share scripts between labs using the same method. They may or may not be plug and play, but we hope to approximate that as closely as possible. You can also use a head turn preference procedure. It seems that only about 20 to 25% of labs are going to use that method, um, but we have point people for using different um, procedures like Habit or MATLAB or um, WISP and SciScope. And lastly, single screen setups, as in one screen in front of the kid, whether it's a giant flat screen TV or a smaller computer, uh, computer monitor, we know this is a common format for a lot of infant research. So um, again, we're going to have point people for a variety of um, programming languages and programs um, to help you do that. And we have a recent plug and play package um, using um, Python. Um, so if anybody's a Python enthusiast or feels comfortable using it, um, uh, John Kaminsky has just created this um, program this week. We've tried it out in a couple of labs with um, mostly uh, success, but that might be a very easy to implement package that could be used by a variety of labs, we hope. And we'll have more information about that soon. That concludes the nuts and bolts. We can move on to Melanie's slide, unless we want to answer um, any questions at this point. Uh, 
I, I just want to, uh, before, yeah, before we get into this slide, uh, I, uh, there was a, a question about should we change our, our procedure um, from uh, having two RAs coding to one RA coding? Uh, and Mike and I had a difference, a slight difference of opinion, I think, on how to answer that. Um, and I think I can sort of harmonize our answers and generalize it to some other questions that people might have. Um, there's, we're, as with some of the other choices that we're making, we're sort of walking a fine line between standardizing everything and making sure that everybody's actually doing something that is a familiar practice in their lab so that we can actually look at those variations in practice. So if it's a simple thing for you to do to, to change that practice to make it more consistent with what um, the instructions are, then please go ahead and do it. Um, if you uh, if it's something that is going to cause potential potentially a source of confusion in your lab, or if it means that all of your RAs have to now be completely trained up from scratch to some new procedure and it's very uncomfortable, then that's going to cause problems in the analysis. So we'd rather, uh, or if your software doesn't allow it, for example. So so deviations are permitted if it seems like the right choice for your lab. Um, does Mike, are we on the same page now about that? Yes, Not yeah, sure definitely. Yeah. Okay, uh, so this is the miscellaneous slide and I don't think I put everything here, so I'll try and work through it. Uh, the, uh, the key thing up at the top, which I did add, was that uh, Melissa Klein very nicely, um, uh, we, we were noticing that uh, even as the people who had put together all the materials, we were having trouble finding everything and figuring out how to get from A to B. Um, so Melissa Klein came in and, and created a, a very nice document for us that um, sort of puts everything in one place and, and gives you some direction about how to go from a start to finish and setting things up and making sure that you understand the guidelines and the um, eligibility criteria and all that stuff. So uh, that's the link at the top there, the start uh, here document. Um, so for, uh, and one of the things that, so there's a lot of information in there about all the eligibility stuff, all the questions that you might have, uh, and all the information about where to look. If, and then there's a list at the bottom of people to contact if you have other questions that we haven't managed to answer here today. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that because it's such a complex um, study for uh, collecting data from so many different sources, uh, it could turn quickly turn into a nightmare trying to process the data. Um, so Mike has put together um, some very specific formats and guidelines for how to contribute your data so that we can automate some of that and not make it a whole hand process. Uh, one really important thing is that if there are sort of, um, you know, if you're not sure whether to discard a baby or something like that, you can't just, uh, or discard a trial rather, you can't just put in comments because this, this may be looked at only by a computer. Um, so if you have questions about how to, to uh, structure your data files, um, talk to a human about it before you submit the data file. Um, don't put comments in the data files. Um, there's we we had we've had also had a lot of discussions about um, what authorship means in this project because there's a, a lot of weirdness in this project in that um, there's so many PIs involved that it's actually kind of difficult for any one person to make a meaningful contribution that would typically be recognized as author level contribution and and you know that's even at the pi level and then once you get into students who are contributing it gets even worse uh but we feel very strongly that that we want to make sure that everybody gets recognized for their contribution um and so uh we've we've put together essentially our thoughts about what authorship constitutes and then to a certain extent we're going to rely on your good judgment about whether you think uh this person in your lab should should be recognized uh, we have discussed having a, a, a strict criterion of only two people uh, per lab. Uh, I don't really know what the status is of that particular criterion, um, but but please try and at the very least minimize um, uh, minimize the people that get listed, and, and we may we may enforce some some limitations. Um, Just note, I'll, uh, we could call that uh, that a guideline. We expect there will be two authors per lab. Uh, if you are in a multi-PI lab, or you have, say, two graduate students who are sharing responsibility, uh, we're happy to have you deviate from that. Maybe send us a note, and we'll confirm it. We've already confirmed a number of exceptions. So that's it's a guideline to follow. Um, really, what we ask is that you use your best judgment in assigning authorship. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to be trusting you not to just stick on everybody in your lab because they were in the building at the time of data collection, um, but really to try to involve people intellectually in the project. So. Uh, they can confirm that they've read the paper, that you've had a lab meeting ch chat about this, maybe led by the person who's collecting the data and so forth. Yep. Uh, and then obviously, um, 
this uh, this whole project and the, the whole um, philosophy behind the project uh, relies on everybody um, being really forthright about everything. There's no um, uh, there's no <laughs> there's no judgments attached to people's reporting. We know that there's a broad spectrum of uh, policies and practices across labs, and we're going to be asking you to report very uh, carefully on those policies and practices. And and I can tell you if it, if it helps that uh, I, you know I know that there are some things in my lab that that are things that other people would uh, consider not good practices, and vice versa. It's just you know we end up in different places based on the, the realities of our, our laboratory situations, uh, and it's really, really important to us that we all be honest about that um, and um, so that, that we can learn from each other and, and make things better. Uh, and I hope that everybody will um, uh, respond to the questionnaires and the questions that we have about lab practices with, with that spirit in mind. Um, uh, it's Unfortunately, we, we can't guarantee anonymity uh, just because of the nature of the project. People may be able to figure out which labs are which. Um, but we are going to do our best to very strongly, you know, um, at, at, from the perspective of many babies, our, our goal is not to finger point, but to look at practice. The, the focus is on the practices, not on the labs. Um, and, uh, it, you know, I, I have a very undergrad heavy lab. It may turn out that uh, undergrads are really pro problematic when it comes to reliable data. And if that's the case, I want to know that. Right. Uh, so uh, we just ask that everybody um, uh, put forward their their most honest answers. Um, and uh, we, we as a community, we're a pretty big, the, all of the people who are contributing data, there's a really large number of us, so we're pretty heavy um, representation of the whole research community. So I think if we together um, take that attitude, then that will make it the attitude that the data are um, uh, approached with. Okay, uh, just a couple notes on ethics and IRB. Um, this slide is contributed by Elika Bergelson, so please uh, get in touch with her if you have specific questions. Uh, we have provided some crowdsourced IRB resources uh, in a folder which is linked from the slides, uh, which you can find in my email and in the chat window. Uh, most folks in the community we think are going to be tagging the Many Babies study onto existing protocols. Um, for example, in my own lab, we have a blanket protocol that says we're going to show some kind of harmless linguistic stimuli to kids. Uh, but um, if you need to do a new protocol, you can use as a model some of the language that's in that folder. Uh, participation in the study requires sharing truly de-identified tabular data. So we believe that this should not require extra permission. Uh, so for example, via the Department of Health and Human Services in the US, uh, this de-identified data that cannot be re-identified has no uh, health information um, by that definition because there's no uh, date of birth, there's no uh, subject uh, name and so forth that shouldn't uh, require extra permission in the US, but feel free to double check this with your local ethics board, especially in the international context where standards may be different. Uh, Video, sharing videos of participants is a suggestion that we make. Uh, we expect that there may be some interesting subsidiary analyses that can be done using those videos, but this is certainly not a requirement, and uh, we know that it's a deal breaker for some labs whose IRBs do not permit this. Uh, our guidance on this topic is that we're going to be sharing uh, video data using Databrary, which is a uh, relatively new online uh, site for video sharing uh, that is curated by uh, Karen Adolph, Rick Gilmore. Uh, they have their own IRB template as well as language to put in consent forms for Databrary sharing. You need to get authorized and so forth. So this is not a requirement of the project, but it is something that if you are interested in uh, uh, contributing video data, it can be uh, helpful for subsidiary uh, data analysis, for example, on inclusion criteria. If you have an approved IRB or ethics document that's relevant for the project, uh, please share it back to us in the folder linked above. We're especially trying to get examples that are helpful for those outside of the U.S. that don't have our particularly uh, particular regulatory environment. And uh, there's um, further info on page two of the authorship and ethics uh, document. Oh, back over to Melanie. Uh, yeah, I just put the slide in because I thought uh, it might be helpful to sort of summarize. There's as we've said uh, in a few places, there's a lot of information in a lot of different places, and we're we're trying to make things as clear as possible. Uh, so I thought this might be helpful to summarize. 
what we're actually asking you to do. So uh, before you start, we're going to need you to fill in that initial sign up form. Probably all of you have already done that if you're on this call. Um, we do want a copy of your ethics approval just so that we can uh, dot our I's and cross our T's uh, when you have it. Uh, we are currently developing a longer laboratory questionnaire um, to get some more details uh, about uh, lab practices that will form part of uh, some of the um, uh, presumably exploratory analyses, since I don't think we have any of that in the um, in the registered report. Uh, but it'll it'll allow for some really nice um, exploratory analyses about uh, practices, and will also form part of our um, uh, complete documentation of the methods that were used. Um, and so, relatedly, uh, we are also asking because we just couldn't figure out how to put all of those questions. Uh, in a laboratory questionnaire. And also, this was an idea that was um, uh, put forward by uh, the folks from Databury, uh, that one thing to kind of ease that uh, is to just make a video that walks uh, the, the viewer through from start to finish, um, that you know shows the structure of your lab and the process that you go through greeting participants, going through informed consent, what, what the inside of your testing booth looks like. Um, I've been sort of paying attention to different people's laboratory setups lately as I've, you know, uh, I've been part of this project and, and there's such variability that I think that it'll be really interesting to see. Um, and uh, so we have a, a documentation uh, that um, uh, Christina made for us about how to make that walkthrough video. We're not looking for um, uh, TV ready performances in these videos. It doesn't have to be a lot of work to put together. Uh, if there are stops and starts and fumbles and whatever, that's totally fine as long as the information is there. Um, and if anyone has serious concerns about the walkthrough video, uh, talk to me or talk to somebody and, and we'll, we'll talk to you. We don't want any of this to be a deal breaker for people, but uh, we are hoping to get this from people. Um, and then when we get to reporting data, we'll ask for the data forms that are in the folder that uh, I believe is linked elsewhere in this document. If not, you can find it in the uh, uh, Start Here document. Uh, and then in Databrary, we're asking for the videos of real participants through the study. If you, uh, if, if that's possible from your ethics, we, we strongly encourage that. Um, and if that's not possible, we ask that you put in a dummy run video. Um, uh, just so that we have a record of, of what the data capture looks like from your perspective um, with either with a, you know, a, a, a doll in the testing booth or, or sort of a, a, a pilot baby that you got permission from or something. Just so at least we have a record, not just of the walkthrough from the perspective of inside the testing booth, but also from the perspective of what it looks like for the coders. Okay, at this point, um, we are going to move to uh, answer a few of the online questions from uh, that were submitted before the, um, the webinar began. Um, and now is a great time to throw in your, um, your questions for the chat window as we go through these. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through just a few of these quite quickly, and then you um, can uh, add other um, questions, and um, we will address them as they come. Okay. Uh, so privacy questions, this is an important one as standards vary tremendously from lab to lab. So please, please put in those questions. Uh, a quick note on funding. Uh, those of you who applied for funding through the, uh, the application process, we've processed the first round of those funding ap uh, applications. And if you had been awarded a small grant, um, that those are under $2,000 US, you will have heard from us. We're collecting payment information, seeing who needs the money. Uh, and then reassessing resources. Um, but uh, please feel free to email with specific questions. Uh, again, we've, we've covered authorship. Uh, you, uh, somebody asked, do they need to know this at the start of uh, data collection? The answer is no, you can decide at the end. Um, we just ask you to use your judgment and we'll be indicating author contributions. Uh, so you know, you'll be saying person X contributed uh, data collection, for example. Uh, some questions on uh, data collection. So uh, there's a question about longitudinal data collection or uh, even uh, just testing the same child twice. Uh, we ask that you don't do this, that each individual child, uh, or let's say each subject ID in the data set refers to one run of one child. Uh, and so there's no duplicated kids in the data set. This is for reasons of statistical independence. That said, uh, this could be a great longitudinal opportunity if you would like to plan something to follow up 
either by, uh, say, collecting MCDI electronically or by mail on kids who've participated, or you'd like to coordinate a couple labs collecting longitudinal data on these kids, that's a great idea. It's a great way to add extra value to your participation in the study and to allow uh, researchers in your lab, for example, to write their own paper about a subsidiary follow-up for uh, some portion of the data. So I highly encourage you to do this. Feel free to get in touch if you're planning something like that. Uh, you know, and, and that would be a, a really nice opportunity that um, adds value to the data set. Uh, we got some questions about exclusion criteria. Please take a look at the instructions document and feel free to use the Google Docs comment feature if you see something that is unclear in, the, uh, in that instructions document. This sort of iterative process of commenting and refinement is how these documents have come to be. And so now as participants in the project, we encourage you to contribute to it. I'll add related to that, that we also have uh, frequently asked questions now at the bottom of that document that Melissa created. Uh, and that's another great place to put questions if you're not seeing the answer to the question that you have uh, after this is done. We make extensive use of the tagging features in Google Docs. So if you tag somebody uh, in Google Docs, they'll get a notification in your comments. So you say plus uh, Michael C. Frank, and I'll then get a notification, and then I'll try to respond or forward it on to whomever, or feel free to tag uh, wh whoever is mentioned in that section. OK, methods. We, we talked a bunch about masking. There were some questions online also about masking. So uh, we are concerned about experimenter and parent bias involved in this study. So uh, I think our general guideline is when in doubt, be safe. So if you think that you, you a particular participant in the experimental setup, whether it's the parent or the experimenter, has a chance to bias the baby, then uh, they should wear uh, noise canceling headphones and listen to the masking stimulus. But if you think there is absolutely no chance for bias, for example, if the parent is outside the room, uh, then they don't have to be masked. Uh, so we ask you to use your judgment and your lab's practices in ambiguous cases, or as always, you're welcome to get in touch with um, me or Melanie or Casey uh, or anybody else on the project team, and we'll escalate in, uh, to um, whatever degree of um, email thread is necessary, whether it's the, the three people, two emails, or the 15 people, 70 emails. Uh, that's what happens with these issues. When they get brought up, we just simply try to discuss them and hash them out until we find consensus. And uh, when we can't, we'll convene a meeting to try to uh, make operational decisions. Okay, a bunch of questions came in about eye tracking. Uh, eye tracking, I know this well because I do it in my own lab. Um, stimulus presentation setups are often proprietary and they vary substantially. We will have some plug and play implementations, an SMI implementation, a Toby implementation, uh, and uh, Alex Christia just uh, offered an iLink Windows uh, uh, implementation. Um, and Dan Yurovsky is the coordinator on eye tracking in general, I believe. Uh, so um, if you don't see the plug and play implementation you have, feel free to contribute it. Uh, or if you don't feel comfortable with that, uh, you can work with the eye tracking group to try and uh, develop something that works. Um, for eye tracking analysis, our measure is going to be as comparable as possible to the non-eye tracking. Uh, so it's just simply total fixation time. Uh, we, uh, you know, uh, if you have specific questions about the eye tracking analysis, um, feel free to contact me. I've been doing the analysis on that side, and we are happy to work with you on analysis code if you have a non-Toby or SMI eye tracker and need uh, new analysis code to be tailored to the particular output files you have. So, so we'll try to help out with that aspect of the study. Uh, and I think we didn't get study setup questions that uh, I thought hadn't been answered, but I'm happy to uh, entertain them now. That was not the right button to click. Sorry. Uh, Sajo Christina uh, asks, will there be special subgroups, for example, HPP folks setting up on a separate email list to communicate? That's a great question. I think as these lists have grown, we have, uh, you know, we've, we've been more and more um, reticent to just email 150 people when we have a simple question about logistics. Uh, so I think we probably should set up such lists. Um, 
and I will be happy to try to facilitate that as we uh, get there. Uh, Dan Yurovsky just joined uh, joined in and uh, is um, reiterating his interest in uh, coordinating the eye tracking labs, um, and he's doing PsychoPy, uh, so that's a, a Python-based um, tracking um, platform. So so you can get in touch with him if you're interested. Uh, guest six asks, when should we aim to finish our data collection, assuming it starts April 1st? And the answer is a year from the beginning of data collection. Um, and we'll be in touch. Um, we are probably going to uh, talk about getting some interim data uh, and uh, doing doing some analysis on the interim data uh, along the way, obviously not for um, kind of reuse in, uh, in stopping decisions. But um, yeah, final data collection will end a year after we uh, um, we begin it. Other moderators, do you see any uh, questions or do you have any issues that you want to address as we collect the last couple questions? No, I, uh, I kind of got, uh, things were posting in the chat window faster than I was keeping track, so I may have missed something, but if anybody feels that their question didn't get answered, you can either try reposting it now or just contact us uh, after the fact over email or on the Google Docs. Uh, it says no goggles on mum or closed eyes in addition to headphones. There's no visual stimulus that is um, uh, problematic, so that's why we aren't asking moms to um, close their eyes or uh, cover their eyes. Um, uh, I think there was also a suggestion that people um, use uh, earplugs. I know that's the standard practice in some labs. Uh, we are not requiring that, uh, but it is a good suggestion. Uh, babies don't have to be sitting on parents' laps. Uh, so some labs test routinely in a high chair or a car seat. Others test in the parents' lap. Uh, we, I believe we're not asking you to deviate from your standard operating procedure in that regard. We just ask that if you have the parent in the baby's lap, uh, please take a special care to try to blind the parent to the audio stimuli by using our mask and confirming, say, with a research, uh, uh, research assistant listening to the stimuli and the mask that they really can't guess what the stimuli are. Okay, we have a, another question about timeline. Uh, there will be a fixed one-year timeline for the whole project. Hopefully it'll be April 1st to March 31st. It may drift um, further back. Um, you are welcome to have your own start and stop dates within that one year, but if you start late, you still have to be finished by the end of the timing of the whole project. So you may end up with only eight months of data collection. Uh, you can't run past the end, of, the end date of the whole project. Um, and no, individual labs will not be running analyses. Uh, you will be making your usual decision making about when a baby has bust out. Um, but we are going to ask you to submit all of your data. Uh, even if the baby only ran in one trial, we still want you to submit that one trial. Uh, but then you need to be really clear about which trials are usable and which ones aren't. A note on the issue of um, running analyses. All of the analytic code for the project is openly available via our OSF link and the linked GitHub repository. Uh, so you are welcome to explore and uh, think about alternate analyses and all of that stuff. We really encourage that and we need more input on uh, the uh, exploratory analyses, one, even once the, the confirmatory ones are pre-registered. But the default will be that you submit this machine readable, very clearly formatted data as in the guidelines and we'll process everything together. Uh, so. The uh, rationale for what Melanie said about reporting all of your data is that we're interested in generalizations about dropout, about uh, sort of proportion of kids we lose at different ages. We're interested in all of that stuff. Uh, that's relevant to the second session baby question. That's relevant to questions about kind of sample planning for the future. And so we really want to have all of that analysis uh, centralized. Right. And, and that's why we're trying to be really strict about decision making about how many more babies to run is that, that as much as possible, there's a firewall between the people who know data, uh, anything about the data, even the number of discard, the number of babies who fussed out um, and how many babies you run because uh, we want those to be really separable. We wanna be able to do analyses on how many discards uh, you had in a given method in a given age group 
and, and all that. And we can't do that if people are adding babies because they had a bunch of discards. Uh, Jess Hay asks um, about the way that different programs uh, include or exclude time spent looking away. Uh, and um, thanks for bringing that up. We ask that you give us um, both total trial time and proportion looking. Uh, and we are going to be analyzing proportion looking, uh, that is time that the child is actually looking at the stimulus. Uh, so uh, total trial time will be a separate variable that we have, um, but the confirmatory analyses are on uh, actual looking time. Uh, this, this is an important ambiguity in the way different programs and, and labs uh, do things. Uh, and and uh, this is maybe a good time to bring up that we know that different labs have different standards about um, repeating trials and minimum trial lengths and things like that, which is why we went with the standard of not repeating trials uh, and any trial exclusions happen centrally. Uh, if there's some technical reason why um, you you know you have to repeat trials or or you have to have a different standard, um, you know through some of the guidelines, uh, we encourage you to provide data but very clear to us about any deviations that you have from the protocol of any type uh, and we'll we'll deal with them okay uh, so we are at time for this call um, one of our moderators has to leave um, and in general we're set um, so thank you very much for attending for taking time out of your very busy schedule to uh, be part of this webinar and to be part of the project more generally we really appreciate it um, we've been overwhelmed and in, uh, really excited by the enthusiastic responses that we've gotten from many participants. And uh, we just hope that this webinar has given you a flavor for the kind of collaborative decision making that we hope to do in this project. So the goal is not to be mandating top down what you guys need to do, although of course there's some of that uh, later in the process. Um, the goal is to try and discuss and come to consensus on key issues regarding the uh, methods. So um, please do not hesitate to get in contact with us if you have questions or concerns. Often those questions and concerns lead to really productive dis discussions uh, and lead to us refining the materials, the procedures, and the analyses. Okay, uh, to end, I will be sending out a, uh, a recording of this call once I have it. Uh, and I will also send out a, the slides and the start here link in, a, in an email to both uh, Many Babies and Many Babies One lists. So thanks again for participating. Uh, we appreciate it, and we'll see you soon.